Welcome to the Whose Body Is It podcast. I'm your host, Isabella Malvin. For those who don't know me, I'm a birth worker, a life coach, hypnotist, and a former liberal feminist turned radical truth teller. On this podcast, I expose the forces at play attempting to control our minds and bodies, such as transgender ideology, pornography, prostitution, and so much more. Together, we'll untangle patriarchal lies as you listen to jaw-dropping interviews with women from around the world. Warning, while listening to this podcast, you might find yourself triggered or perhaps notice where you've been biting your tongue on the issues that matter most to you. In my coaching and hypnosis, I help women and men stop getting triggered by every single thing, cultivate resilience, stop unwanted behaviors, and increase self-confidence. You can book your first session at whosebodyisit.com, and you can find that link in the episode show notes. And I just want to say that it's because of your endless support that I'm able to interview amazing women, get their stories out, and produce regular episodes for you. So with that being said, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. And if you're listening in, leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And also consider making a financial contribution via the link in my show notes. You can also visit my activist sticker shop. My pro-woman stickers have the power to intercept transhumanist programming. So take a photo of your stickers out in the wild and tag me on Instagram at whose body is it. Without further ado, let's get into this week's story. A Swags has gender critical women cracking up on Instagram. Her reels skewer transgenderism, homophobia, and misogyny in mainstream culture. I like to take the ridiculous claims like how misgendering someone is literal violence and highlight the ridiculousness of it, she says. However, Acewags didn't always see the humor in it. For three and a half years, she identified as gender queer. Growing up, she experienced discomfort in her female body, and classmates would make comments about how she wasn't feminine enough, like a football player trapped in a cheerleader's body. When she reached adulthood and entered a liberal arts college, she stopped identifying as a woman. Transness seemed to explain why she felt deeply unsettled by her body, to the point where she wanted to cut off her breasts. After positioning herself as a non-woman, she realized her entire paradigm needed to shift. She desisted, and her talent for acting emerged as a way to express herself in our woman-hating, lesbophobic society, and provided a way to create connections with other women tired of screaming into the void. In this episode, we also take a look at the state of the lesbian dating world and how young lesbians can find love today. Okay, so some of you have seen A Swag's uh, reels recently. I've, I know if you follow me on Instagram, I've been sharing your stuff a lot. I mean, just really hysterical content and a reprieve from the maddening, um, disturbing state of the trans clown world that we're in. So would you um, maybe just start off by talking a little bit about yourself and how you came to be comedic activists at this point? Yeah. <laughs> I'm an actor. That's like my career. I, I don't necessarily make my living from doing that because I do mostly theater gigs and theater. It's hard to make a living out of that. But I that is my day job, so to speak. I'm a lesbian and a D sister. So I didn't identify as a woman for about three and a half years. Started in college, liberal arts, of course. But then kind of got woken up to just all of the raging misogyny within the trans spaces um, and just the whole ideology of gender, then got peaked a number of times, found Magdalene Burns. And, um, you know, I initially was offended by Magdalene, but the more I watched her, the more I was like, well, she's making a lot of sense. And then she got ill 
Um, I don't know if you know Magdalene Burns. Um, I I peaked after she, I think she she died in 2020. Yeah, so I was I didn't start speaking out till about 2019. So I was just kind of coming into her, but I wasn't necessarily like a a cult follower uh, uh, by any means. But yes, now I I watch a lot of her content and I appreciate yeah. her. Well, so she really inspired me um, with her bravery and just kind of her like her getting over the fear and, and encouraging other women to speak. And so then when she got sick, it really hit me hard. Um, and she told everyone who watched her videos, you know, that the best thing we could do is to speak up. Um, and so it started with me being like, OK, I'm going to do what Magdalene suggested and I need to start speaking up. So I made a um, like a meme account. That was, I never showed my face um, and that was great, but things got a little intense and it started just dragging my mental health. And after about a year and a year and a half of having that, I stepped away from all social me media. Then the pandemic happened and I got TikTok again, was just going to watch funny videos. I, I don't know. I just, I think I got inspired to, to follow what Magdalene said. And I was like, well, I have ideas for skits. And so I was on TikTok for about two years, I think, making content and kind of finding my my comedic voice, especially on this topic specifically, got a lot of threats, got a lot of backlash, kind of learned how to handle that negative energy and also learned what I was going to spend my time on arguing with and what I was just going to let roll off my shoulder. Right. Um, then I got banned <laughs> from there, but luckily I had saved all my videos. So I've then made an Instagram and have just been uploading old content and then making new things. And yeah, I have a, I have a dream of there being a, a gender critical sketch comedy show, you know, kind of like, I think it's called black lady sketch show or, uh, I can't remember there's a, there's a sketch comedy show that she does like or Al alternatino is another idea like that sort of vibe but all surrounding like just women's rights and and sexism and all of that stuff so that's that's the the goal <laughs> mm. so w take us back to your liberal arts experience um I went to an art school and I had a a D trans a formerly transidentified woman named Emma who also went to RISD and we were talking about like having gone to a like an art school and all the propaganda there but I'm yeah were you in like the north was it a northeastern it was a, a west coast school it was west coast uh, school okay and um I was in college from 2012 to 2016 so the the gender stuff kind of was beginning it was like getting on the springboard but it didn't fully jump off yet and it started with me just wanting to be a good ally to transsexuals um because I had had a friend in high school that had started to transition and so upon just kind of being a good ally I came across the concept of being non-binary or being gender fluid gender queer and I fit the definition perfectly and I was just like oh I didn't even know what, what. And um, I also had been dealing with some PTSD from sexual trauma. So I was very disassociated from my body, but as you do with trauma, you don't necessarily always connect the dots. So I was just like, all of a sudden I want to cut my breasts off. What's that about? And I had always enjoyed passing. I'd always loved, that's one thing I loved about theater was being able to just completely transform and I could play men, I could play women. Um, you know, once since since I was a child, I loved playing the boy parts and all of that stuff. So, you know, according to the internet, that meant that I was was trans, and um, I believed them because I was a young eighteen to nineteen year old, and I didn't necessarily enjoy the idea of that I was trans. Like, it, it wasn't necessarily something I was ashamed of, but it wasn't something I shared. Like, I never put pronouns in my bio. I didn't want to make it a big deal. I was just kind of like, well, this is, you know, another part of me, I guess. Like, another thing that makes me different from everyone. But it also was nice to kind of understand a reason for me being different than most of the other women and girls 
that were in my life, right? Like I finally had a, an excuse that it's like, oh, because I don't have a girl brain. That makes sense. Because I'd been told things growing up, things like, you know, you're like a football player trapped in a cheerleader body or, you know, when are you going to learn that you're a beautiful woman? And I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just kind of took on that identity because that's what I just, I thought it, I didn't have a choice, but it wasn't something I like celebrated. And it also helped me understand why I was feeling the way about my body that I was and why I wanted to remove body parts. And luckily I come from a family of doctors. So I understood the, the risks of taking cross sex hormones or doing HRT. So I, I knew that I didn't want to do that because I also was on amyl and antidepressants. So I was like, that could fuck with a lot of things. So I'm just going to stay away from like fully transitioning. And I drew the line of I'm not transsexual, I'm transgender. And that's the difference. And I can advocate for transsexuals while understanding that I, you know, don't have my brains in the wrong body. So just fully believed it. Thankfully, I did take a a, a, a woman's study class. It was called Sex, Gender, and Sexuality. And the professor there was a butch lesbian. And she was very good at not letting the students know what her thoughts were. But in hindsight, I'm like, oh, she totally was fed up with everything, mm. uh, you know? And having her give me notes on some essays that I wrote, I think she helped steer me in the right direction without fully being like, what are you talking about? You know? Um, so I partially, you know, I'd like to thank her one day for not indulging those beliefs. She no longer teaches that, that class or even that subject. Like there's no more queer studies. Uh, and I can understand why, because she would lose her job if she didn't say the right things. So that was my liberal arts experience. <laughs> mm. What did your parents say when you told them you were so I, like I said, I didn't want it to be a big deal. It took me a while to come out to them at the time as bisexual. And then, you know, as lesbian, I think they both knew they're like, I think you're just a lesbian. But I was like, no, I, I'm bi. I can find a man, you know. But so I, I told my mom about my gender queer thing. And I could see immediately she had no idea what I was talking about, you know, or the they, them. And I just kind of accepted, like, she's never going to call me the right pronouns it's not because she hates me. I just have to get over it. And that was kind of my mentality was like, people are going to call me what they call me. And I just have to learn to cope with the the sting of being called she, because I did feel a sting. That was part of why I thought I was genderqueer is because I hated being called she, her, or a girl or a woman or anything like that. But they, they love me. My parents have always been very supportive of me. Now they both are seeing me just completely transform and the other side. And they're still supportive, even though they sometimes don't understand why I'm so passionate about this mm -hmm. subject now, but they like my Instagram reels. <laughs> so that's all that matters. <laughs> wow. So you mentioned, you know, when you were on TikTok, you were getting a lot of like negative energy that, you know, that's a question I get asked a lot. How do you deal with the attacks? How do you deal with the criticism? You know, what, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what it did to your mental health or how you how you coped? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think I remember the first hate video that I got where someone like just dedicated a whole video to calling me out and having their tens of thousands of followers come to my page. And that was scary. But once it happened, I was like, OK, more of this is going to happen. Like, what can I do? So I like turned off stitches. So people who I didn't know could, you know, and just, I, I, I filtered comments. So, you know, I would have the comments that I would see. And then if I went to the, the filtered comments, they would just be pages of pages of people calling me a turf or calling for me to unalive myself and just all these, all these things. Um, so I just wouldn't look at the filtered comments or actually I would look at the filtered comments and I would go and I'd block every single person that it would take me hours to do that. I would just sit down and dedicate a chunk of time to just blocking tons of people. But then that got to be exhausting. So I think my fatigue at blocking everybody that wanted, wished violence on me got, got worse than the fatigue of having violence wished on me. 
Um, so I just ignored the block comments and focused on mm-hmm. the, the positive ones. And I think as I gained more subscribers and followers, the more people I had that would show support or, or thank me. And uh, I would screenshot and save messages from people that were like, thank you from this country or thank you from that country. And this is how much you've helped me. And I wish, you know, all these things. So the support, and and that's why when I, on my Instagram, when I thank my followers for their support, like it really, I really mean it. Like it, it is what helps keep me going mm. and helps me feel like I'm not alone because at the beginning I felt completely isolated and alone. And I now have more in real life friends that are also critical of the movement who support me and, you know, who at least I can go and get a hug from virtually because we're none of us are in the same location but so I I guess to answer the question it just started with where I focused my attention and then having more support and the support eventually outweighed the hate and having the support helped me get braver I will say though there was a point where someone who knew me uh, didn't know me personally, but like knew of me, knew people who I knew. We worked in the same vicinity as as actors. She found me and I got really freaked out. And I, I thankfully saw that she commented that she doesn't believe in doxing because everyone was begging her to dox me and say what mm. my name was, say where I, where I lived, where I worked, all these things. She was like, I don't believe in doing that. I was like, thank God. But that was that was one like real life. Like I was like really scared. And that is still a fear of mine of having actual violence. But, you know, there are also precautions that you can take with that as well. Um, And learning self-defense is a big one of them. So I I hope to take more defense classes and that sort of thing in the near future. It's wild to hear you say that. Yeah, I think maybe for listeners too, it is wild that it would it would get to that point yeah I've, I've had some creepy stuff yeah it's always it's always way worse from people that you know who have been to your home who know your parents like oh yeah it's real bizarre I had an onslaught after the um women picket dc event I took a photo with one of kelly j's it was the trans women are men and most have a penis and I held it right under the um washington monument the big phallus and I was like just poetic (laughs) right it was just too good to pass up and I just kind of threw it up on Facebook I hadn't used Facebook in years like I hadn't posted it it just was like I didn't even know who was on there I don't know what why I did that but I did and my god hundreds of comments mostly from kids from my people from my high school all sorts of crazy threats and some of my closest former friends liking comments from People saying that they, if they had the chance, they'd punch me in the face. I'm like, this is my best friend for like 15 years. It's, it's wild. Yeah, and and I I have lost friends, but thankfully, the the f- close few that I've chosen to keep in my inner circle, they all support me or at least respect me enough. They don't always agree with everything I say. Mm -hmm. I definitely know that I can make them think about things, but you know, they would never want harm on me. And I've just, I I've the past few years, I've come to the conclusion that if you're not going to be like that, then you're not going to be a part of my life. And it, it makes making friends difficult because there are a lot of people who I know are fair weather friends or who, If they found out some of my opinions, like lesbians don't have penises, they would want to punch me or they might punch me or they'd go find someone to punch me. And it's, I have, it has really changed how open I am with people. You know, I've, I've learned to really kind of keep my cards close and to test waters and and things. It's very, very strange. It really is wild. I, I have a small circle as well, but more recently I had a couple experiences out in the wild and just was shooting my shot and um, got some mixed reviews. But, you know, at the end of the day, I was like, you know, felt safe enough to reveal myself and um, 
but it is it is scary when you just don't know right when because when people think that you're like literally causing violence i mean that's your latest reel that you i think you just posted today for those who haven't seen it i'll um uh, oh i'm gonna link a swag's uh instagram in the show notes but uh the one you posted today was with the trending audio dumb ways to die and would you maybe like talk a little about it (laughs) yeah so it's you know the trend is people showing videos of them doing something stupid where they like fall off something or or and uh as they're falling it'll freeze and the song goes dumb ways to die and so i took that and did you know getting misgendered and dying because misgendering is literal violence and then you see dumb ways to die because some guess what you don't actually die from getting misgendered but yeah, I've heard the phrase misgendering is violence or it's literal violence or it, anything like that. And it's just such a ridiculous claim to me because butch lesbians get misgendered all the time for men and it doesn't devastate them. Or it, it, And if it does, they they learn to cope with it and it doesn't actually kill them. And, you know, I was when I was genderqueer for three and a half years and I got called she, her all the time. It didn't kill me. It hurt my feelings. Didn't feel good, but I uh, survived it. So it's just ridiculous to me uh, that people say it's literal violence. And I like to take those um, kind of extraordinarily extreme and ridiculous claims and highlight the ridiculousness of it. So it, it's it's just so funny to me if that were real, like I imagine being in a conversation with someone and then they go, yeah. And he's, and then they see you just like die. And like, <gasps> and it's like, Oh no, 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 no. And it's, like, I just imagine. I meant she, I meant she, I meant she. I'm so sorry. Oh you my God. I'm sorry. I used my eyes and my senses and my humanness right. to determine your sex. How could I? Oh my God. It would just be, what a crazy world that would be. Um, so that would be like a sketch in my gender critical TV show, right? You know, just people drop in like flies. Anyway. Oh, you've got to make it happen. Yeah. It doesn't seem like so far off. I know. I just need a production team. I th- feel like it could happen on YouTube, you know, but like mm-hmm. I, I have the script ideas and I have the acting. I would need some more actors and then mm-hmm. someone with a camera and a mic and then we'd all have to be in the same place there's a lot of things but hey if any of your followers are like I want to do this hit me up we can we can make it happen I I mean I I, yeah I I I bet I bet there will be some interest I mean um you know I've spoken to so many just like visual artists you know all over the country who are not able to show their work in galleries because they're making feminist art they're talking about these issues and yeah it is a matter of just kind of banding together and and as you said having a, a space or you know, starting to network, you know, I think a huge part of this or that I felt, I think a lot of women who feel like the access point to their work is taken away, you know, through a training requiring, you know, the trans doctrine or a theater company, you know, making it totally unacceptable that, you know, what a woman is, you know, or the, the gallerist not wanting to show you because they're getting threats because you're turf, whatever is like, are we willing to create the thing that we say that we want? Or, you know, we felt entitled to our whole lives because, There was a formula like you get an MFA or you you get a BFA, you go to a theater company, you apply for jobs. You know, this is like merit based or connection based. But then now there's this whole other part that's getting in the way. And yeah, I think it's like a sobering reality. And it's it's like I I definitely felt frustration. Like, is this really what I got to do? Like, I tried to be a doula. I tried to be a fertility awareness educator. And like this whole trans thing is just getting in my fucking way. So maybe this will be my thing now, you know, but like. It's I'm so glad you said wild. that because I asked I asked my Instagram followers what stops them from speaking up and so many of them said fear of losing my job or not being able to get a job and I really sympathize with that because I was the same way that for for years I was like I can't ever speak up about this because I want to be an actor and who's going to hire me if I you know but as time has gone on I've realized that one This whole thing, the idea of being able to change your sex or just the transgender ideology is so unstable and unfounded that it's going to fall eventually and hopefully within my lifetime. Um, And so I'm kind of banking on that and that eventually all of the people who would cancel me at one point are going to be like, hey, we actually can hire you. Um, And then also 
I'm banking on the fact that there are enough people who agree with me, enough women who agree with me that I can have a career with these people that are willing to work with me. And that's kind of been, I, I'm putting faith into that, you know, because I know that there are theaters uh, where I would want to work that would not hire me as of right now, especially if they saw my content. Mm -hmm. But I'm also trusting that there are plenty of people that would hire me. Mm -hmm. um, or there are plenty of people that would be able to not care. You know, and I, I I do feel like things are changing in that regard, but I'm also learning how to just not take part in the pronoun ritual that happens before every rehearsal, you know, and uh, and finding ways to kind of push back against this ideology that's seeping its way into it and just being like, you know, I, I don't find it beneficial to do that or it actually is triggering for me to say pronouns or all of that. So I'm not going to wear a pin about, you know, what my sexual orientation is or something like, yeah. So I'm glad you, you brought that up too. Cause I, the doula industry is wild. I, that was a, I remember there was some YouTube video of a woman who was taking like a doula training and she got kicked out because she pushed back on the idea that men can, give birth or something and like she and her free friends just like were sitting in the in the park outside smoking weed and ranting about it and that was I was just like wow like doulas of all places were anyway yeah the arts almost makes sense because artists are a little we're a little crazy but you think that like a woman's central career for lack of a better term like a doula would at least hold strong, but yeah, where you literally are like watching babies come out of vaginas and helping women breastfeed their babies. Yeah. It's totally, it's pretty freaky. It's pretty scary. It's pretty nuts. Well, you have, you know, you, you have so much good, like lesbian dating content. Can you, can you talk about like your experience, like just being a woman who loves women when you're, you know, expected to see men yeah. with or yeah. without penises as lesbians too. Yeah. So I guess some, some background for me. So I, I really tried being bisexual. I really wanted to be bisexual. I wanted to be happy with men and I just couldn't do it. Um, and one of my first kind of peaking moments was when I was talking with a trans woman friend of mine at the time and he obviously identified as a woman and in in middle school he had had a crush on me and and he was like you know the first time that you were asked out was actually by a girl like it could have been a lesbian relationship and i remember looking at him and being like the fuck are you talking about <laughs> like you that's not at all what a lesbian relationship is like so, so at least my my sexuality helped me stay grounded in reality because I knew the difference between being with a man and being with a woman, even though at the time I was identifying as genderqueer. So even in my genderqueer days, I still knew biological sex mattered. And it's because my orientation, that's the, what the whole trauma surrounding my orientation was about, was coping with the fact that it's same sex attraction, right? So cut forward now, I'm now a confident lesbian or I guess at the time I was calling myself a feb femme, which is a female exclusive bisexual female. So it was me being like, well, I'm still bisexual, but I only want to be with women, even though I can, I could be with a man, but I just don't want to be. I, I've like never I said, heard that. Can you say it again? A feb femme? No, feb feb femme. Lesbian. It's an acronym. Yeah. F-E-B-F-E-M. Female exclusive bisexual female. Oh my so God. It's it's to and to be fair, it's it's kind of uh, bisexuals reclaiming bisexuality while not stepping on lesbians, but like being mm. able because there is a difference between the bisexual women who primarily date men and only mm. date men and the bisexual women who will primarily only date women. And so it's kind of a way for there to be a distinguishing factor between those two types of bisexual women. So at the time I was feb femme. Now I'm just like, no, I'm, I'm never going to be able to be happy with a man. So I um forget it. But at the time I was on dating sites and I was only interested in women. I got kicked off of Tinder in less than 24 hours because I put female only. I was very explicit in my, I only want biological female humans within 24 hours. 
thing was gone um, for no no reason as to why. Then I, I tried Bumble and there was no option where I wasn't able to see biological men, or I should say just men. It was always, you know, the option was, do you only want cis women? Do you only want trans women? Do you only want women? You know, and I, um, I was like, no, I just need any one of my biological sex. I don't care if they take testosterone and call themselves men. I don't care if they call themselves non-binary. I don't care if they call themselves women. I just want them to only be biologically female. And I was going back and forth with, you know, the customer support with Bumble. And they eventually told me, well, that's not an option on our site and I was like then you don't cater to homosexuals and you you are being you are a homophobic app and you know left it at that then there was her <laughs> and her is now I I think it's just it's him because it's only Tim's it's only trans identifying men on there who call themselves lesbian and on her though I think I was on her in 2018 around that time it was still mostly all men like just trans woman after trans woman after trans woman um, but I did find two friends on there that were both, um, one was a detransitioner, one was a de-sister like me, and we both kind of had, I don't want to say dog whistles, but let's just say that I was able to see, oh, based on what you're reading, you're probably, you know, and uh, so I did make two good friends in that, but I also remember there was one woman or so I thought, who um, I messaged and was messaging me back. And then eventually she goes, so I should be clear, I'm actually a man. Um, his pictures were very, you know, like you only got to see half the face or like the hair would be falling down and filters and all that stuff. And I'm like, oh, well, you know that this is for women, right? He goes, yeah, I just, ha I'm so feminine. I have no luck on Tinder. So I thought I'd try my luck on here. And I'm like, huh. Well, I'm a lesbian or I'm a feb femme, so I'm only interested in women. He's like, oh, damn. Well, you seem really cool. I'm like, yeah, you too. I mean, if you want to get lunch to like just to hang out, you know, and get, you know, be friends, I'd be down for that. And it was great. So we met up for for lunch. I was like, this isn't a date. This is, He knows that I'm a lesbian, like that I'm not into being with men. But like we did have a good conversation and he agreed that with me that like the gender stuff was crazy. At the end of the lunch, he just goes, oh, man, I really wish you weren't a lesbian. And I'm just like, see, man, this is the problem. <laughs> like, you knew I was. This isn't a date. There's Ew. no way. You know? And like he was, he looked very, man like he just had long hair. That was the only thing, you know, and he's very, he was very lanky, very skinny. So in pictures, it's easy to make your photo look like whatever you want, especially with filters and angles and clothing and all that stuff. Right. Um. But what's funny is that I actually uh, saw him again a couple of months later with a, um, a woman that had turquoise hair and they both were like covered in hickeys. And I was just like, I bet he met her on her because she's probably a, a they them. And now they get to call themselves, you know, being in a queer relationship. And it, I was I was just like, so he gets to find a date and a girlfriend on a lesbian app and I get to only go on, you know, one date with a man. <laughs> Who oh my god. So that's the online scene. I eventually was just like, forget it. I'm done. Um, and just kind of accepted that I was never gonna meet a woman online. I did eventually go to women's land for the first time last summer, um, which was just an incredible life-changing experience, spiritual revolution for myself. I met a woman there and we we dated for six months, but um it was a uh, six months was a good a good chapter and now that chapter's closed and I'm I'm feeling rejuvenated and feeling mm -hmm. like I can meet someone but it's only going to be on woman's land that's the only place so lesbians if you're watching this find out where to go to women's land because that's that's where you find girlfriends it, it really is women's land really is like the the heartbeat of lesbian culture I think mm. um, so yeah it's mm -hmm. hell out there for dating. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. And uh, we heterosexuals have our own problems over here, but it's all pretty bad. It's all, I mean, just, you know, God, I mean, yeah, I remember when I was on the apps seeing so many men, so many men um, who 
were calling themselves trans women. Like, like they would be coming up on my filter because I would say like men only and then they would be coming up. And then I would also see like women who were pretending to be men with like just like literally just a woman with like a polo shirt. Right, right. Like and what? that happens with lesbians too. Like if if I do find an actual lesbian or an actual homosexual woman, chances are they probably don't they probably don't identify as a woman. I, I did go on a few dates with this one woman and after we broke up, she um, like was on testosterone and it's just like all of the butches are just, it, it's, it, it's very targeted too, because there would be ads for testosterone on these lesbian dating sites. Mm -hmm. It just feels very, very nefarious. Oh um, my gosh. On the day, I don't see. I don't even think there were ads when I was on the apps, yeah. and yeah. like at that point. But that that is so nefarious. Oh my gosh, yeah, nefarious is the great way to describe it. Oh my god, and it is really like trans the gay away. It really is. It's it's so homophobic, and that is so frightening. When you agreed to go on the date with that guy with the long hair, were you like peaked yet? Oh yeah, I was or fully. And that was part of why I agreed to go to lunch with him because I was on there like, just like, if you're not radical, I'm not interested. And so then he messages me and immediately, he doesn't tell me he's a uh, a man at first. He lets right. me believe that he's not, but we're talking about how gender is really stupid. And he's agreeing with me like, oh my God, this beautiful woman with long hair is agreeing with me. Like we're on the same page. And then, you know, then he tells me he's a man and I'm just like, Are you serious. But, and you know, to be fair, the fact that he was hiding that, that sh I should have not agreed to meet with him because that's a huge red flag and like, right. But again, like develop a sense of trust and like rapport. And then he's like, oh, now, right now she's attached. Now she has a, an and, expectation yeah. of who I am. And, and, but this, this I think goes to show how isolating it feels. And I was just like, you know what I had at that time, I had no friends who were critical. And I was like, if there's just one, even if it's this mm. creepy guy that has tricked me into talking to, to him on a lesbian app, but he agrees with me, like I would, sure, I will go to lunch and we can just talk. And then at the end, of course, it turned into the, man, I wish you weren't a lesbian, like creep. Yeah. So I'm I, like I said, though, I did end up meeting two good friends on the Her app, but that was after like having it for three years. So <laughs> yeah. And now it's all men. I don't I don't know if that there's a single woman on there, to be honest. I haven't been on it um, and I don't plan to. It'd be il really interesting to do like a deep dive. I don't know if you've already done this, but like into the her like owners and developers who is making these deals with the advertising agencies to to run these ads like that. They're. That is and the community guidelines basically making it impossible right. to say you only want one sex or you'll get booted for being hateful. Right. It's right. definitely run by homophobes and misogynists. I know that, but it would be upsetting if that homophobe and misogynist was an actual homosexual woman, because there are plenty of lesbians that just throw everyone else under the bus and you know, I had a conversation with one woman where she believes that you can't be an actual lesbian and believe in this stuff. And I thought was a really interesting idea. Um, and I'm not sure what I think yet, because I, I do think some some women are just they just don't think about it. But um, I don't know. It would be interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if the her creators were Tim's. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's just, gosh, it it is like the cognitive dissonance is so strong. Like, uh, it, it, you know, like the the two things can't be true, right? We 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 can't believe in homosexuality and then also believe that um, it's irrelevant when choosing a sexual partner and that you should like. I mean, I, I mean, what is a sexuality, you know, to begin with, if it's not choosing yeah. to only have sex with a person of the opposite sex or the same sex. I mean, what, and to, what? to feel an undeniable attraction to one, but not the other, you know, like I, as a teenager, <laughs> um, before I kind of was putting two and two together, I would always mistake Justin Bieber for a woman. Um, like I would see a poster of him as like for, 
I don't know, some American Eagle outfit. I was like, wow, that woman is just, and then I'd be like, oh, that's just Bieber. And immediately, like a light switch, the attraction, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a guy. Never mind. Um, and, you know, it's as a young, not young child, but young teen, you know, I would have crushes on girls. I didn't necessarily know were crushes, but in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, like I didn't control who I felt the attraction to. It's not like I'm checking people's sex before deciding if I find them hot or not. I just mm-hmm. did find some people attractive and didn't feel an attraction to another. And, um, you know, I'm glad I finally chose to be to honor what I actually want rather than forcing myself to take part in a type of relationship that just will never fulfill me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. I mean, it's coercive. It's like coercive in, in its nature. And I think, yeah, you bring up a really good point. And I think maybe like for those listening, like pay attention to that red flag. If, If there is a guy who's impersonating a woman who's like whispering to you that he's like not down with all the, the extreme ends of the trans stuff. Cause it's also popular, I think on some level now to be like, Oh yeah, it's gotten kind of crazy, huh? You know, like so many heteros, like I went on a series of dates with heterosexual men who would, you know, be like, you know, quote liberals, you know, in their day jobs and with their friends, but then would whisper to me that they watched Joe Rogan or like, they think the trans stuff has gone too far, you know? So just pay attention. If, you know, if you have a guy who's saying one thing, like, and you're vulnerable and you don't have anyone else to talk to, like, make sure you're like not making a decision out of scarcity, you know, and that's a really good point. And I think also it's like intriguing on some level to, you know, like the buck angels of the world, you know, it is intriguing on some level to be like, Oh, like they're impersonating the opposite sex, but they have this boundary. I wonder what that's about. You like red flag, like, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The true transsexual uh, line in the sand is very, very intriguing to me. Um, and I I would love to have a conversation with those who claim to be a, quote, true transsexual, because there is something to be said for your life experience will be very unique or different if you're passing or you're taking cross cross sex hormone if you're taking hormone therapy because everyone has both hormones right if you're taking hormone therapy if you're getting surgeries that have health effects on you like there's something to be said for that's a unique lived experience but you're still having an experience with the sex that you are so like a trans men experience is still a woman's experience it's just a very niche very unique experience Right. Um, and trans women are having a very specific, unique male experience, man experience. And it's just, I think for me, the specificity of language is very important. And um, it's something I, I, I need to get a much bigger vocabulary with, you know, I'm, I'm like, it's if I'm going to be this specific and if I want to describe things in other ways besides masculine and feminine, I'm going to need a much bigger vocabulary than I have now (laughs) because uh, it's hard to describe things without just relying on stereotypes. But um, yeah, I would be very interested in talking to a true transsexual so that we could kind of figure out where, where, what this line is and what lines within language you're using and all Mm -hmm. of that. What categorizes as quote trueness is just the like, access to sophisticated medical technology you know without that there would be no illusion of trueness classist if you think about it you know if you have the means or the money to do it that makes you true if you you know if you if you were born with a bone structure that makes it easier for you to pass as one sex or the other which the whole passing thing you know if that's what makes someone a true whatever like that's ridiculous um, because I can, I, if I try really hard, I can maybe pass as a teenage boy. That doesn't mean I'm a teenage boy, you know? Um, right, right. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. Yeah. And just speaks to like the, oh well, yeah, the, the adolescent fascination from the women, you know, when the women are victims of the gender identity industry you know they cut their breasts off and they uh grow beards like at best they look like adolescent 
boys. Like, you, you know, it, it, there is a lot of the time. Yeah. Like the Go Justin ahead. Bieber, like the uh, maybe the whatever the equivalent would be now, but just that um, like there's this, oh God, there's this woman that I came across who makes so much content. You might know who I'm talking about with her daughter. And she made a joke about how when they're like her two with her, she gets mistaken for her teenage daughter's boyfriend. Like they'll be at a restaurant and people will say like, oh, you're such a cute couple. And she's like, no, this is my daughter. Like I'm her mother. But no, but now she's like her father. And it's like she was a teen mom. So she's already like on the younger side, maybe like barely 30 or early 30s. Um, And she's with her 15 year old daughter. And yeah, she you know, it, yeah. Anyway, it's not that all women who take testosterone, who take, you know, who are on hormone replacement therapy and cut their breasts off and grow beards that they don't all look like adolescent boys, but it is like aesthetically, I think it is a standard. Um, like it's fashionable, I think to embody like that, that look. And that's so weird. I'm going to say for a mom to brag about that happening or to talk about that happening. My my mom and I got mistaken for a couple, for a lesbian couple at a restaurant. We were given the couple's menu for like, and my mom was immediately like, hey, uh, we're mom and daughter. We don't, we're, we're, we can't have this. You know, and they're like, we both were just so embarrassed. And, right. and we're just like, what the fuck? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, we walked in arm in arm. It's because we're mom and daughter. Like, no. Oh my God. Oh and so God. just the idea that a mom could be like, you know, I get mistaken for co- like, that's just weird. That's weird. Well, yeah. She's like collecting ev- like it's it's validating. Right. It's all about validating the delusion. And, you know, it's you know, it's affirming to be like, wow, this waiter thinks I'm like a hot young dude. And like that's, you know, how she wants to appeal to her like lesbian partner. She wants to play that, you know, role of the hot young guy. And that. I'm glad I'm so glad you said that because I forgot to bring this up that part of what motivated my gender queer identity was internalized homophobia and was the the need to not be a woman with another woman. I wanted to be the man. I wanted to be the boyfriend, the object of desire. Right. Right. And and to to take on the I guess supposed responsibilities that the boyfriend would have mm. versus the girlfriend um and it really does break my heart when I see lesbians fall prey to that because yes we have gay marriage and my parents were the most supportive they were they were supportive of, of me being same-sex oriented before I even accepted it myself right but I still growing up in the bible belt internalized this idea that God hates me or that, you know, I'm going to hell or that there's something inherently evil or wrong. Right. And and that really, really influenced my self perception. And I did not think I was gender queer because I was like, and then I get to be a man, but it just, the comfort that I felt with taking on a gender queer identity, the quote euphoria that I was experiencing was because I had it was alleviating my internalized homophobia because I no longer had to have that shame of, well, I'm a woman with a woman. It was like, no, I'm a man with a woman. Yeah. And it just, it's hard. It sucks. (laughs) Thank you for, yeah. Thank you for speaking to that. That's such an important part of, of this specifically. Yeah. Experience of young lesbians. I imagine. Wow. There's a really crazy phenomenon too of, of heterosexual women wanting to be gay men and like the there's I'll I'll send you I can't think of it now but there is a a great interview of a straight girl straight woman now who talked about as a teenage girl she really fetishized being in a gay relationship and being with men as a man it's fascinating Uh, because that you know and that also when I in hindsight I'm like well when I considered myself genderqueer, it also made my interactions with men feel different because then they were no longer, they couldn't, how could they objectify me? Because I'm not a woman anymore, you know? Um, Of course they still did. And of course I still felt, you know, part of why I wanted to cut off my breasts was because of the attention it would give me. But having that genderqueer identity at least felt like I had a shield up from misogyny and i i can't help but wonder if that happens to straight women too because you would be surprised about the number of 
heterosexual women or bisexual women that want to be with men, but they want to be with men in a male way. Yeah, <laughs> it just, you know, once you want, as soon as you think you've seen the whole iceberg, you realize that there's an entirely new section that's just lying under the surface. <sighs> Human psychology is real fascinating. It's uh, never ending. Yeah, as you said, it's wow. You're I mean, it, yeah. I mean, there were points where, you know, like I would be like planning out episodes and I'd be like, have I covered everything? I think I'm done, right? We think I think I got to everything, didn't I? I'm like, nope, there's going to be 5,000 more episodes to yep. go. <laughs> you know, yeah, because there's just so many. Yeah, it just there's the uncovering is that is really that is really wild. Yeah. And, you know one thing we didn't talk to but uh, talk about explicitly but you know just the phenomena of you know how social media has been used reels instagram in particular because that's you know my point of reference that's where i spend most of my time the romanticizing of the like you know taking the young lesbian uh and really turning her and her story into like a hero's journey of becoming a man like i've i've seen like this is an another trend i've been seeing is um like just to like a lesbian relationship and one woman's like in the mirror, like she's looking at herself in the mirror and her girlfriend is shaving her head. And then you see the like, you know, months go by and her progress pics of, you know, her, her transformation. And it's just wild. It feels very ritually to me, either ritual, like watching an eating disorder progress video or ritually like, you know, you're watching a religious ceremony happening and you're seeing the transformation from one to another. It's, you know, or the, the classic videos of this is my voice one month on T. This is my voice one month on, like very just like, yes. what's, there's something going on there. Yeah. Do you ever just wish that uh, you were like a bird and you didn't have to worry about any of this shit and you could just find some twigs, build a house? <laughs> day because i think about that sometimes <laughs> that like um, i i don't know if i've imagined the bird but i i have definitely imagined a more simple life yeah but from time <laughs> to time but but you know at the end of the day there's actually there's no other way i want to spend my time than illuminating this and i you know i think one of the gifts that that we both have is being able to alchemize and turn the frustration into something, you know, like into art, into creation, into a podcast episode, into an infographic, you know, whatever it is, you know, at the end of the day, I get so much satisfaction and fulfillment in helping women sort out what the hell's going on and, and why they feel uncomfortable or like, what is misogyny or like, what is an experience that you had that also I had, you know, that sheds a light on like our struggles as a, a sex class or like what is happening to women globally, you know, across race, religion. So I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, I have tried to take breaks and be like, what would my life look like if I didn't think about this? But ultimately, this it's is hard not a, to think about it when you're affected by it. It's hard not to think about it when you're affected by it. And when you find a sustainable way to do it, it doesn't, or I'll speak for myself, like I I, I feel like, you know, I, I have, I have, you know, phases where it feels more difficult, or, you know, but I, I think I have found a way to make it sustainable and not be that initial drain, fear, um, panic, urgency, you know, kind of state that, that I found myself in early, early turfdom. Yeah. Um, so I think the sustainability of how you're, you know, finding a way to do this in a way that like, you're still in your genius, like you, like, you know, in your creation and your, in your gifts, um, is a really like special thing to, to come, to come to. That's so beautiful. And I, I could not agree more, um, as much as being a bird might be cool. Um, I, I, I agree. I think having it, I wouldn't want it any other way because stifling my voice on this issue out of fear inhibits, inhibits my soul from doing its purpose. Or if you're not even spiritual, just inhibits you from living life to the fullest. And it's a really great thing once you kind of get in the groove. And I, I think the key is having a support system, having whether it's followers or even just a family member or one friend that you can talk to about it makes 
all of the difference because otherwise you might find yourself going on a date with a man that pretended to be a woman so that he could try and you know uh so don't do that just stay centered be true to yourself and and speak up because it will feel so much better than if you don't it really it my mental health is so much better now that i get to like you said transform the the muck into something positive and that allows us to talk about these topics in a way that's digestible and encourages finding solutions. I think that's that's an important thing to do in our life. I think that's a a beautiful note to to close. But before, we'll make sure is there is there anything else we didn't get to? No, I just want to thank you so much for having me. This was an incredible conversation, and um, yeah, thank you. This was great, and I love the content you make. So thank you for doing what you do, and bringing light into the world the way that you do. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you, ASAGS. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or family member who needs to hear this content. And if you do share it on social media, don't forget to follow and tag me at whose body is it. So until next time. <laughs>